Well, let's talk about the protectors uh, a little bit because that's yes. a huge part of what this film is all about and this story. And we mentioned them a little bit earlier. Uh, our mutual friend and the late Anton Zimba. I mean, you know, he had the foresight as well to to say that you know the Rangers are buying us time. It's what we do with that time that really matters. Yeah. And these long term long term strategies are really what he was talking about and what really shifted our organization's focus from more ranger support to the youth and education and those types of things. But, you know, I'd love to hear from you. What is the importance of these rangers on the ground? Maybe you can even start back, you know, you said you guys got involved in 2008, which was really the beginning of this whole rhino poaching crisis, Mm. which created the need for uh, more well-trained, elevated uh, security within a lot of these reserves. Mm. Uh, But why are they important? What role do they play? Why should people within that landscape care about supporting these rangers? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I cannot, you know, first things first, I I just cannot overemphasize how important they are and how important they always will be. Because we refer to it on on the broader landscape, we refer to it not so much as security, but area integrity, Mm because it involves a whole lot of other things just, you know, beyond just security. Um, So that being said, fundamentally important and will always be because we are focusing now on a particular um, issue which is the um, which is rhino protection and the you know the increase in rhino losses since 2008 and how that really ramped up and and what it did first of all was it so so, so we're talking about that but you know even without that there's still the need for area integrity um, there can be you know bushmeat uh, poaching, which to me is more what poaching actually is, what mm. these guys are doing in terms of rhino and in East Africa, elephant, um, it's not poaching, it's organized crime. That's what it is. You know, it's like, it's literally like the drug trade, you know, they've, they've changed from, you know, smuggling mm-hmm. cocaine and heroin or whatever it might be to smuggling, you know, parts of animals. Yeah, a lot and, of parallels with things that are happening in Mexico and places like that. Exactly. Know, the, the exactly. Drug cartels. Yeah. So these are cartels and we must not fool ourselves that they are poaching rings. They are organized crime cartels. Um, so, you know, I think that it's taken us a while as a, uh, as a group of wildlife um, and, and um, conservation organizations, it took us a while to actually wake up and go, what the hell's going on? You know, um, so we were caught, I think, a little bit on the back foot back in 2008. And, you know, particularly the national parks, because they're a bigger machine with a lot more inertia, whereas the smaller reserve, you know, the private reserves are you know, privately funded. We can respond quickly. We, we tend to be a lot more agile. And I think that that was what we did. And that, that whole western boundary of the, the, the Kruger National Park, um, which is all private reserves part, forming part of Greater Kruger, was a an area that has now very quickly developed into a major strength buffer for the national park you know giving them a a, 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 a breather you know because that possibility to enter into the reserve into the national park through those uh, parks has, has, has been cut off or reduced significantly so um so in terms of the work that 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 these guys needed to do field rangers back in 2000 and you know, when we were first in the reserve, 2001, two, three, four, five, they were, you know, they were guys that went out and checked on, you know, uh, erosion sites and, uh, you and know, more how focused the, water, on the water was. Right? It was more yeah. conservation stuff, how the grasses are in certain areas. And of course, they would check fence lines mm-hmm. and there was always, you know, looking for snares. That's normal. That's what a reserve does. That's what the guys are normally trained to do until then the wildlife crime associated with rhinos started to pick up. And then there had to be a change in years. And these guys had to go for training that they were never subject to before. There was no need for it. They were literally almost becoming paramilitary to, to be able to respond to a threat that was a deadly threat. I mean, you know, guys were not uh, coming to, um, you know, to, to uh, kill a rhino and take its horn uh, you know, with a, a knife and a spoon. These guys were coming armed with, you know, automatic rifles. So it was literally having to respond to a deadly threat. And I think that uh, 
the, the, first of all, the willingness for those teams of men and women to put up their hands and say, I'm actually willing to do this, showed an incredible commitment, an incredible love for the bush and a love for what they are doing, you know. Um, and, you know, as, as, as Anton's, um, you know, uh, tragic murder really um, indicated is that the, they're literally putting their lives on the line. So what they do and how they do it has developed probably, you know, I don't know, a hundredfold in the last 10 years. The investment in it has been significant um, and ensuring that there are enough uh, people on the ground doing what they're doing, ensuring that they are co correctly and appropriately trained um, and giving them all of the support associated with that um, has been part of this holistic model to like, okay, here we have our area protection services, our area integrity services. And um, and I feel like, you know, the, the Timbavati has did particularly well. Um, and I, I might be open to correction. I need to check what the stats are now, but I still think that we may still be sitting with being the lowest losses of rhino per hectare of any reserves in in South Africa, certainly in the Lowfelt Valley. But you know, I'm I'm very happy for somebody to correct me on that if if I'm wrong. Uh, but it was at one stage very definitely that, um, and you know that happened through a number of interventions, um, but certainly a very big part of that was the development of that ranger field ranger team the support of that field ranger team with appropriate technologies and uh, deploying them effectively throughout the reserve and um, you know and and supporting them effectively and i think that uh, i think that the timavati has done particularly well on that i'm really really proud of the of the the, the work that they've done and, and i've been a, a little bit of a sideline observer because my involvement is more on you know the commercial operations and economic development uh, as a portfolio on the on the executive committee um, and there's other people and the actual management who are involved in you know security and area integrity and I think that the the work that they've done is really laudable it's 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 quite astonishing if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe like and review our podcast on YouTube Spotify and Apple